Hey guys, thanks again for tuning in TFB TV. We'd really like to thank our sponsors and we'd really like to thank you, our viewers, for coming into the channel. Um, our sponsors, Ventura Munitions and ProxyVid, they really help out with getting the kinds of video cameras and equipment that we need to film future episodes. So today, I think we've got a really cool episode in store for you. So what we did is, my, myself and my friend Brush, whom you guys have seen in the Mark Omar videos, is we went out to Colorado and we got in touch with the Vietnam War veteran by the name of Colonel Gregory Dillon. He was an infantry officer in Vietnam, served two tours of duty during the conflict. And Dillon, you know him, but you don't know him specifically by name. If you've seen the book, if you've read the book or seen the movie, We Were Soldiers, written by Hal Moore and Joseph Galloway, the reporter that was at the battle, at the Battle of Audrang, at the Battle of Audrang Valley, um, where first the 7th Cavalry was essentially, they were dropped in and it was a hell of a couple days for them. And it was one of the mo one of the largest significant battles in the beginning of the war that really opened the public's eyes to the war. Anyways, Dillon was Colonel Halmore's operations officer. Dillon, after the battle, was engaged in another battle called the Battle of Bo uh, Bong Song. Dillon captured an AK at this Battle of Bong Sung, and it was one of the older versions of the Kalashnikov, some of the earlier ones produced in the 1950s. Um, but he captured this, and somehow this rifle came to exist in a reference collection in the United Kingdom. And we were able to go to the NFC and get a bunch of pictures and video of that particular rifle and we're actually able to meet the actual guy who captured it and carved his initials into the stock. So to me, as a military history enthusiast and just as history enthusiast in general, this is fascinating. We've got this rifle that he captured and we're actually talking to the real guy almost 40, 50 years after the fact. So I hope you guys enjoy, and you hope, I hope you guys stay on for future episodes in which we have future talks with currently Colonel Gregory Dillon. Tell um, the story of the rifle. Yeah. How it went by. Yes. Okay. So just so this came yeah. to pass. So this. It's amazing. So so this particular AK-47, it's a milled type one or two, one of the very early variants, has an early magazine. Um, this particular AK-47 currently rests in the Royal Armories, and that otherwise known as the National Firearms Center in Leeds in the United Kingdom. The story behind it, from, from what our perspective before I got in touch with Colonel Dillon, mm -hmm. was that it was sitting in the National Firearms Center, and for the longest time it had this engraving which said J.P. Dillon 1-7 mm -hmm. um, on the stock of it. And for the longest time the staff of the National Firearms Center had no clue as to how what the history of this particular mm -hmm. rifle was. Eventually in the early 2000s, um, there was some research done and uh, people at the NFCA got some research done. They found out who you were and they mm -hmm. got in touch with you. And yeah. I think Jonathan Ferguson emailed you and then you confirmed it a little bit. Actually, I think I talked to, he talked to you? him on the phone okay. the first time. Anyway, one of you, you know, hey, is this be you? Yes, that be <laughs> me. And, uh, but, uh, we, were, we had conducted an operation in the Bonson Plain, which is about uh, two or 300 miles north of uh, Saigon, right along the coast. So just and real quick, something that confused me at the beginning, Bonson and uh, the Idrang Valley, completely different campaigns. Oh yeah, a couple completely hundred miles different. away. Yes. 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 Okay. Yes. Different operation altogether. Yeah. This was in April, and that one was in November. Of 1965? Yeah. Yeah. 1965 or 60? It was in 66. 1966. 66. Okay. Yeah. Uh, I previously had gone up to that area to take some mail to some uh, U.S. troops who were in a small outpost that belonged to the 22nd <clears throat> Arvin Division. <clears throat> I took the mail to them and the chopper landed inside their compound. I was talking to them and they they looked apprehensive, and I said, you know, why, what are you worried about? And they said, look over there, and over in this, well, among all these pine trees in the middle of this plain, you could see bad guys digging trenches and bunkers. This was straight up NVA. <laughs> yes. This wasn't oh, yeah. Vietcom. No, these were the, were the, yeah, first team. <laughs> <laughs> the first string. Yeah, first string. Yeah. And... Uh, 
so I said, well, who have you been telling about this? So we tell division all the time. And they said, oh, don't worry, we'll get around to that. So uh, I got in the chopper and I went back to On K. And um, we were responsible for the security of the thing. That was our turn. Mm -hmm. So uh, I, uh, asked, I asked Colonel Moore, uh, I said, well, you know, that's a great target. Why aren't we doing something about it? <laughs> he said, okay, well, I said, you know, it looked to me like it was uh, a battalion, maybe even larger, that was, you know, trying to count up the troops running around. Anyway, we got them surrounded before any of them could get away. And we put a lot of firepower in on them uh, throughout the day. And uh, by early the next morning, we pretty much had wiped everybody out. Mm -hmm. So uh, Moore and I landed there in the in the complex and with the sergeant major we we're walking around and Moore's talking to the battalion command one of them who was involved in it <coughs> excuse me and sergeant major and I are walking around looking at bunkers and I see this foot sticking out of a bunker with sandal yeah on. and I said oh I wonder if he's got any weapons in there and I grabbed his ankle and yanked on it, and he yanked it back. <laughs> and I was like, oh, you know, that was an oh shit moment. <laughs> and uh, so I got him pulled out, Sergeant Major, and I pulled him out. And he was delirious because he had been, uh, someone had thrown a smoke grenade in the bunker, and uh, the smoke had uh, got into his lungs and everything. So we had him laying there, and uh, he had on a nice looking pistol and holster that gave, gave that sergeant major, I think he gave that to Colonel Moore. And uh, they had this brand new AK, brand <laughs> new AK. And I said, no, that's gonna be my prize. So <laughs> I picked it up and I slung it over my shoulder. And uh, I picked up this NVA guy, he was in uniform, I knew he was an officer because he had the little clips on his collar. I picked him up, threw him over my back, and I walk into the helicopter. I didn't realize it, but he was bleeding out of the mouth. He bled down the back of my back. And later, someone was saying, oh, you're wounded. And, you know, no, no, you can't get my job. I'm not wounded. <laughs> and uh, so uh, anyway, he, the next, by the next day, he was uh, conscious. So we took him back in there. And he went around and identified all of the different bodies. Now, we could tell the officers, because they had little things on their collars, but he identified the battalion commander, a couple of company commanders, and so forth. So it was pretty successful from that point of view. I don't know what happened after that. I think we have to turn them over to the Arvin. But, you know, so. And but. the operation in general was, uh, you had very few casualties as well, you mentioned earlier. The operation uh, the, for the clearing out portion. Yeah. You know, how many casualties were taken, or you mentioned that, something? That like one that. was very few casualties compared to what you inflicted yeah, on the yeah, enemy. Yeah, uh, it was four hundred and I think four hundred and twenty-four enemy killed, and we had like mm, uh, uh, maybe five, and a couple guys wounded. Uh, so it it was it was a pretty a good following the the book. Operation, of course, losing and, uh, guys. Is <clears throat> never, and, uh, yeah, I think well, while we were there in April, division sent down and said everybody who has an AK has to turn it in, and uh, they knew I had it. So oh, then, oh, and especially tell Captain Dillon he has to turn in his <laughs> thing. <clears throat> and I thought this is bogus. They said it was for an Arvin unit that was gonna work in Cambodia. And they wanted them to have AKs, so if they had to fire them, it didn't sound like M16s. Mm -hmm. They have two different sounds. Plausible deniability yeah, sort yeah. of deal. <clears throat> so, uh, uh, okay, so I turned it in. And uh, about two months later, one of the guys from division sent me this magazine. Well, well before well, that, no. before that though, Oh, where I carved my name. Where in you it. carved your name yeah, in the Yeah, so stock. nobody could display it. Yes. 
So yeah, I'm sorry. I mm -hmm. took a, my bad, uh, honey knife and cut that in there, and I said, if someone, some faker had that and tries to put it over his fireplace, <clears throat> it's going to have the have the name. At least your name is going to be on but that. Be Rems on rifle. That. He yeah. will be able to say, "Hey, I did that," <clears throat> but. It was gone. I don't know, he forgot about it, I guess. Mm -hmm. And this guy sent me this magazine from, it was from some big show down in Saigon, and, was, and he pointed out in the picture. And there's the AK right there with, you can read the name on it. Yeah. And I said, well, I'll be a son of a gun. There it is. I, I knew it wasn't going to Cambodia. Yeah. yeah. So then. So that was the last time you ever saw that it. That was it. Yeah. That yeah, was gone. It was gone. 1966. Yeah. And then, what, 2005? 2005. Yeah. Uh, this guy calls me up and said, uh, my name's Jonathan Ferguson. I'm the curator of the British Small Arms Museum in Leeds, England. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> what, what can I do for you? He said, did you ever have an AK that you put your name on, GP Dillon 1 slash 7? I said, yeah, I did. He said, we have that. <laughs> Tell me the story about it. So, so from, what we, from what we know from Mr. Ferguson's side, what he's told me is that, so the AK, so this particular rifle got put in a bunch of pile of rifles that were going to go to Cambodia. However, there was, apparently there was an American officer who walked by that pile, saw it, realized the significance of it with your name on it, and said, hey, I'm going to keep it because it had your name on it. Uh, so apparently he took the rifle for safekeeping or something and that's probably how it ended up into this uh, magazine right here, oh. displaying a bunch of uh, weapons yeah. right here with your name there. Yeah. That's probably how it ended up right there. And in, interestingly enough, the magazine in this photograph, it's not present at all, which might lead us to believe that the magazine currently on the rifle um, isn't the correct magazine that came with it. It oh. isn't the same magazine that you probably picked mm -hmm. it up with. Mm -hmm. So that's just not on the magazine. However, after it showed up in this photograph, the trajectory of events which led it from Vietnam to the United Kingdom. So it appears that the rifle be uh, got into the hands of an American intelligence officer or an American intelligence agency within South Vietnam during the war, probably like 66, 67 or so. And a lot of these intelligence agencies and, you know, they're, what, MI6 and CIA and stuff, they all mm -hmm. talk to each other. <clears throat> and especially the whole purpose of the pattern room in the United Kingdom, part of it was to gain intelligence of foreign weapons mm -hmm. overseas. But that was it, it was strictly an intelligence, you know, foray to gain what is the enemy using, what is the enemy developing. So I think there, along the lines, we figured out there was a British intelligence officer who cooperated with an American intelligence officer. And he said, and the American said, hey, look, this is a pretty neat AK. You know, it goes back. Whether or not they realized it went back to the Battle of Audrang, uh, we're not exactly sure. However, in that sort of transit bit, the rifle then migrated from South Vietnam to the United Kingdom oh. into the original pattern room, which was in Enfield. And, okay. But then that was shut down in the late 90s, early 2000s, and then it was moved to uh, Leeds, where it is today. Anyway. And anyways, well, thank you so much, sir, for sharing the story. Oh, yes, God, Lord, that's, that's the right. craziest thing. Funny mm -hmm. how all this stuff comes back. It's, it's